Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We're glad you're listening today and... Well, we're going to talk all kinds of things gardening. If you would like to give us a call, that's what this is, by the way, a call-in show, 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or you can email me at gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And oftentimes the uh, photo is worth a thousand words, so a well-focused photo that you attach to your email would be very, very helpful. Uh, We sometimes get photos that are a little bit fuzzy, so make sure I can see what it is that you need me to see to diagnose uh, the question. We are kind of in this limbo now where the calendar says we're in November, and our, our temperatures sometimes reflect that and sometimes not so much. It's been kind of a warm week that we've had here. But uh, we've got a lot of questions related to that over the past couple of weeks at the AgriLife Extension Office, and I uh, am going to address some of those. We have some email questions that I'd like to go through as well. Uh, But, for example, uh, one uh, question that came in uh, from Leonard uh, has to do with uh, how far apart, uh, to, excuse me, that the, the tags on trees often say how far apart to plant them, but they don't tell you when. And what's the guidance on planting? And let me just say that for any kind of woody plant, that would be a fruit, could be a fruit tree, a shrub, fruit shrub. Uh, it could be a normal landscape tree, a normal meaning a shade tree or a flowering landscape tree. It could be a shrub in your landscape or even a woody vine. The best time to plant is right now, and because here's why. We've, we've passed the heat of summer. The demands are going down dramatically on that plant, and if you plant it now, the transplant shock is less because you're not trying to just, you know, give it the little drink every day like it's been getting at the garden center uh, where you purchased it from, and you're able to not have to worry so much about t- as being touch and go on how to water. The main reason, though, that we like to plant in the fall, I say mid to late fall, probably late fall is even a better narrowing down, is because that tree has all winter and spring to grow before the hot weather arrives. So if you uh, waited to plant, let's say you're going to plant a peach tree, uh, and if it's bare root, they only come in, you know, in the dead of winter, January, and you're getting them planted in January or February uh, to get them in the early, early February to get them in the ground. Uh, But I'm assuming this is a container-grown plant because of the time of the question. And we have a lot of container-grown woody ornamentals and fruit. So let's say you're planting a peach tree that grew in a container. When you put it out there, make sure that any roots that are going in a circle around the container that you cut them. And this is true, again, woody ornamentals. Uh, Just uh, two days ago, I got a picture of some problems in the bark at the base of a trunk. And when I looked at it, the grain of the wood was going horizontal, left to right. So if you look at a trunk, the grain is going up and down. So what's up with that? Well, what's up with that is when it was in a little container, probably about a two and a half gallon container, that root went around the pot. And then maybe it got bumped up to a 15 or 5 or 10 or whatever size. And that circling root then became hidden inside of the container. And so when you plant it, let's just say at at the time it was moved out of the pot, that root was about the size of spaghetti. And so if you go three years, five years, eight years, 10 years, 12, 15, somewhere in there, the root growing in diameter and the trunk growing in diameter come together. Now, this isn't true if the root is out, you know, 18 inches from the tree circling, but uh, it is true for most plants that that are bumped up as they're grown. So what happens when they come together is that root essentially has its own, you know, outer bark, uh, and, and it's not just not like the tree bark, but close to it. So it doesn't grow into or it doesn't attach Uh, to share resources with the trunk. It's just a piece of wood wrapped around the trunk. 
it might as well be made of metal. And as that trunk gets larger and the root gets larger, it literally strangles the trunk, especially if it goes all the way around. Sometimes it just goes maybe half or two-thirds of the way around. But it, that's really bad for trees. And the problem is you don't notice it until years down the line when you start to see the tree looking like it needs water and you water it and it just the leaves don't have good nutrient lo uh, look to them. The, they seem drought prone. Uh, and it's because it can't get water. It can't get water through there to go up or it, it can get very little. And so always, always, always when you pull it out of a pot, if it's any kind of woody ornamental, just go ahead and cut the outer roots. It won't hurt them. I did this, I did an experiment uh, in this. Uh, in fact, I was down at Arbor Gate Nursery uh, working with Beverly down there. And they had some uh, trees that uh, they allowed me to go in, and a couple of them cut the outer root on the tree. And then we put it back in the pot, and I came back two weeks later, and there were already little two-inch white roots coming out from that cut end. So when you cut the roots, it is quickly going to re-sprout, just like if you cut a branch. You get buds breaking and and shoots that come in to replace what you cut off. So I guess I've kind of beaten that horse to death, but it, it's really important uh, to do that for good establishing. And the best time to do that, to do planting, is now. Uh, you, the second best time is midwinter, and the next best time is early spring, and the next best is late spring. I mean, you can plant a tree in July or August, but you're, it's very touch and go. And in most cases, that tree stress uh, really sets it back. Uh, so anyway, just some thoughts there. Uh, I've had a lot of questions uh, for sure about that. Our phone number is 979-845-5689. 845-5689 or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Gardensuccess at tamu dot Edu. I uh, also had a question come in from Eric, uh, and Eric has uh, browning and reddening on the cedar trees on his property. Uh, he sees this also on trees along the fence line, uh, and a lot of these evergreens have turned this, this bronzy red-brown color, and what's the cause of it? The cause of it is primarily due to drought. Now, there are other things that can kill a tree, and when a cedar or other needled or scaly needled evergreen uh, dies, the the, the uh, foliage turns that kind of color. But uh, I think this one is primarily due to drought. And, you know, you think about it, those trees have lived here quite a while. But we have been through a series of really stressful tree events. There was the freeze of 2021, February 2021, that was just unheard of and, and flat killed tissues and trees, kill some trees outright. Uh, but killed a lot of tissues in trees, causing splits in the bark and issues. Then we've been through now, this was our, I think, our second summer, where for 45 days we're not getting any rain, and the temperature's over 100 degrees, and, and that is incredibly stressful. And so anything that weakens the tree, it's much easier than for some small thing to finish the tree off. And uh, in the case of the cedars, they something collapsed in the system, and when no longer could you get the, the uh, water up into the tree, it turns brown. And when a, any kind of a needle, even scaly needle type evergreen turns brown, it cannot come back. And here's why. They can only re-sprout from the base of a living needle. That's true of a pine tree, and that's true of a cedar tree for sure, or junipers. Uh, and so if you were to prune back behind the last living needle, you would find that that branch cannot sprout. Very different from most of the trees out there, but that's the case. Uh, when Christmas tree growers are shearing their trees to make Christmas trees, if they shear too deep and cut back and you you got kind of some brown twiggy stuff, that'll never fill back in. Maybe from the sides gradually, you know, growth comes in toward that area, but they just, they just pull it up because certainly not uh, worth uh, from a uh, profit-making standpoint. So Anytime we see this, that's a problem. And I, I've seen a lot of it this year. Uh, you know, we, we always tend to lose post oaks during stressful times of various types. We also have lost some other, other uh, types of trees. I've seen elms uh, go down and uh, a number of different species. But when, when this happens to our, our evergreens, that's just a sign that it, 
it's it's a compounded drought. I don't fully understand all the other things that could be going on. I suspect there could be some other things because I've had some very unusual situations where it was kind of hard to pin a drought on it. But uh, that is what's going on. That I don't know of any insect. Uh, I don't know of any disease. It's not like a foliage disease hit the whole tree uh, kind of at once, turning it brown. Uh, so that is what I would say. Uh, we're going to go to the phones now. Again, the number is 845-5689, and we're going to talk to Wilf. Hello, Wilf. Hi there, Skip. Um, I've got a question about some, uh, a particular kind of weed in the grass that uh, we're seeing more and more of these little white. They're sort of a purplish. And I talked to a botanist uh, who said that uh, the only way to get rid of those is to pull them out by hand or um, and if there had been on the next door, there's some been discussion of um, whether or not these that particular uh, weed is you know, really killing a lot of grass. Okay. Because some lawns are totally filled with it. What uh, What do you recommend in terms of eliminating? Could, could you describe for me the weed or again? Should we? Yeah. Could you describe it again? Uh, it's, yes. It's. Um, it, it grows in in the grass, and uh, they're little white or per, uh, sort of purplish flowers. Okay, I got you. Um, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, uh, that is a a weed. I believe the it's a type of aster, and I believe it would be called slender aster. Uh, that's the name that I you will find it on on Aggie Turf. If you go to the Aggie Turf dot tamu.edu website down in the bottom left you can click on weeds and they have lots of pictures there and you'll find your weed that weed sprouts and comes up in a vacant lot it'll get on waist high it gets real big in a mowed lawn it goes horizontal oh, yeah. and it weaves itself through the runners uh, and you don't notice it until one of two things happen your lawn starts to die uh, I saw a lot of lawns this summer that were turning brown, and the green weed stayed nice and blue-green color. It has a bluish-green color uh -huh. uh, and because it's so dug-up drought-resistant. Uh, and then the other thing is when the flowers appear, you see it, and you'll drive around town and see it everywhere. Uh, it Once that weed is going, we say, reproductive, it's blooming and setting seeds, it's too late to spray it then and kill it with a post-emergent broadleaf weed control. You could use pre-emergence during the season, uh, stagger them out about 60 to maybe close to between 60 and 90 days to try to shut down the germination of it. But right now, the number one thing is to get out and pull it. And I know no one wants to hear that. Uh, I've got some on the edge of my yard where they're coming in from another property. I have a five-gallon bucket, and I just go out there and... Uh, the soil needs to be moist for this to work, but you can find where it's coming out of the ground. It has a single taproot, and you can pull a weed. Sometimes when you pull it, you got something three feet across because it's spreading out that far. Uh, but if you pull it, you can get the seeds out of there. Uh, one year I counted the seeds in one flower, and I think I hit 50. <laughs> and those things can have 100 <laughs> flowers on them. So, uh, the, oh, I believe it. Don't leave the seeds or you'll be sentencing yourself to a lot of years of uh, more years of echo, I mean, of uh, pain and suffering from that. So anyway, that that is slender aster and that's what you do. And then in the springtime, uh, pre-emergent and that's again in the summer or uh, using a post-emergent. But you kind of have to be able to find the weed because you don't it doesn't stick up much during the season. So it'd be kind of fine. It'd be hard to find it to spray the product on it. So I think pretty well, especially if you're mowing the lawn, that it keeps yes. it down in the grass. Yeah, it keeps it down in the grass. And, uh, uh -huh. and the the leaves look different uh, when they come up, and then versus as when they mature. When they mature, they're real strappy leafed, uh, but it's a little different when it comes up. So, I guess the bottom line on the call is, you know, get maybe get a one of those weeding forks. Sometimes they're kind of hard to pull these weeds up because they have such a taproot. Uh, but I found that 90% of them, if I grab them, I can wiggle them around and they'll come on up. Uh, but whatever you do, get it out of there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree that it's much easier if it's if the uh, soil is moist. Yes, that's right. It's easier to pull them out and pull them slowly. You pull too hard, too fast, you break it. Yeah, and but if you break that root off a couple inches underground, I don't think it's gonna. 
I don't believe that has the ability to regenerate from that. I'm not certain of that, though. But, yeah, that's true. Yeah, if there's nothing, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Skip. All right, you take care. And that's a good call because a lot of people have that question right now. Well, good. I hope they do something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, take care. I appreciate that, Wilf. Um, our phone number is 979-845-5689. And by email, garden success at tamu. dot edu. Uh, had a question come in from Becky, and uh, the lot service was asking if she wanted them to put down a winterizer fertilizer. And so, uh, her thoughts are, well, November's kind of late, isn't it? Uh, so, is it or not? Well, uh, the, what a winterizer fertilizer is. You can call it a fall fertilizer or a winterizer fertilizer. I really don't like that name, but it's what they call it, so we'll we'll talk we'll talk about it with the name they put on it. Uh, during the season, during spring and summer, you're fertilizing with a product that you should be fertilizing with a product that has about a three one two or four one two ratio of nutrients. So lots of nitrogen, the first number, not hardly any phosphorus, and a medium amount of potassium. That's kind of the standard for lawn care. Of course, each lawn soil nutrient content can be different. So if you do a soil test, that may change the fertilizer choice a little bit. But 312412, when we get to fall, we do not want to push that grass to growth because when you push a grass with nitrogen and water in the fall, brown patch, which is now called large patch, those big brown circles start appearing a lot more because you've predisposed the grass to the disease. So in the fall, we go to a fertilizer where we drop that nitrogen down. We don't want it all gone. We need it to go into the, the plant with the potassium, the third number. But it may be a, a ratio like a 2-1-2 or, or something along those lines. It's just you want plenty of the third number and you want much, much less of the first number. And that is what should be put on the lawn in the fall. Now, we're getting a little late. And I think you can still do some good by applying it now, but not nearly as much good as, as had you applied it in uh, late September or early October. And the reason is that that gives it time for the plant to take up the roots, because what that does is it strengthens the plant, and it helps it make carbohydrates that make it more cold-hardy and that help it to come out faster, greener, healthier, if you will, in the springtime. And so the fall fertilization fuels the spring emergence of grass growth. It uses stored energy, not stuff from the roots, hardly uh, compared to the stored energy reserves that are so important. So that's why we do it. And that's why I would say if you haven't done it yet, go ahead and do it. Uh, but do it today and water it in today so those nutrients become immediately available uh, to the roots. Uh, but check it, just because they're calling it a winterizer, make sure it fits the ratio that, that I was talking about. And that is about a equal amounts of nitrogen and, and the first and third number. Just think of it that way. Uh, y there's a lot of products out there, and they get called a lot of different things. So, But make a point. Put it on the calendar for 2024, late September, early October. Get it done then. Appreciate that uh, email, Becky. Uh, our phone number is 979-845-5689. We're going to go now and talk to Ed. Hello, Ed. Hi. Good morning, Skip. Good morning. Um, good morning. I sent you, or good afternoon, actually, I uh, sent you some pictures of tomatoes that were planted as plants in, like, early August or, or late July. Okay. And they began blossoming during the heat of the summer, but they didn't set fruit until it cooled off. Now they look like it's got some kind of wilt. I don't know if you can see the pictures I, there. I can, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. No. And they, they seem to be dying off now. I just hope I, they'll stay alive enough to for the tomatoes to mature. But I suppose that's a common disease in the fall? or Well, not, ne not necessarily just fall. We, we can have wilt diseases at different times. Uh, there are... There are fungi that can in the soil that can cause a wilt disease. Uh, the verticillium and fusarium are two examples. That's why when you buy a tomato on the variety, it may have letters like V, F, N, T. That just means it's resistant to the things those letters stand for, and two of those are wilts. There's also a bacterial wilt uh, that's different that can get in there, and what it does is it plugs the plumbing 
and you know you're trying to get water through the pipes inside the plant and you just have all these things gooey masses of bacteria clogging it up and uh, so that could be it uh, if you want to do a post-mortem to see which kind it was uh, you can cut a stem off uh, and put it in a clear glass of water and just hold it and if it's bacterial will you'll see this streaming it almost looks like you know how sh sugar has a uh, swirly molasses -y kind of consistency in, in water. It, you'll see it streaming out of the cut end of that tomato. Uh, if you split the vine lengthwise about halfway through and you see streaks of brown, that's one of the, the fungal wilts that is affecting it there. So okay, good. what, what yeah. do you do now? Not much except assess it so at least you know what you're up against next year. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Yes, sir. I appreciate that. Thanks for the email. Mm -hmm. Our phone number is 979-845-5689. 979-845-5689. Uh, Karen emails about putting a second round of fertilizer on New St. Augustine side. And the first time they fertilized was about four to six weeks ago. Well, four to six weeks is, I would say, that was your fall fertilizing when you did that. So I wouldn't put another one on now. Um, it yeah, that that is pretty well carried you in so I, I would stop and again the reason is we don't want to spur more growth uh, and so we want to make sure that the lawn has the health to make carbohydrates which fuel everything you know interesting fun fact at least it's fun to me <laughs> you may not care but we call fertilizer plant food and you see that all the time and fertilizer is not plant food fertilizer is the ingredients that plants make used to make their food. Plant food is carbohydrates. And, and so uh, when you put down nutrients, you're just giving them the building blocks of making food for the plant. Now, of course, that's a, I guess you'd say that's a technicality. Well, okay, but you know, we're in a university town. <laughs> Facts matter, right? So, uh, but it always kind of humors me to see the word, the words plant food uh, associated with fertilizer. Uh, so Karen, I would, uh, if that fertilizer has a uh, ratio similar to 312, I would hold it over and in the spring when you've mowed the grass twice, put your fertilizer down. And that's going to be in the first half of April. Most years it should be in the first half of April. So just hang on to it. It'll still be good. Uh, another question I've gotten several times over the last month is uh, how, how long can I keep fertilizer in the garage and it still be good? Well, that's, that's kind of a uh, that's not a black and white line for sure. But if you've had it for a year, I would just use it. You know, just go ahead and use it. It's going to be fine. It's not like it spoils or something. Now, I guess in the in the case of an organic uh, food, uh, there may be some degradation in terms of survivability of the microbes that are part of why people use that kind of thing. But anyway, you get the idea. Had a question come in by email from Matt, and it is a citrus plant growing, specifically a lemon, growing in a large container, and that's a good-sized container for that plant. Uh, and what you see in the picture is old leaves are green, dark green, and the newer the leaves get, the yellower they become. They go through this stage where they're lacking uh, Maybe the veins are greener than the area between the veins, and that is classic iron chlorosis, uh, lack of iron. And uh, let's just uh, let's just go into just a little bit the difference between a mobile and an immobile element. For those of you who are gardening nerds and want to learn a bit a little bit more, uh, some elements the plant can steal from older growth and move to support new growth. That would be called a mobile element. Immobile elements, when the plant uses them to make, let's say, an older leaf, it can't take them to support new growth. And iron is an immobile element. So the old leaves stay green. They don't start turning yellow because of a lack of iron. The new growth can't get enough iron. That's, that's why the immobiles are. Uh, and then mobile elements, you usually see them first in the older leaves. And eventually, they, of course, can affect the whole plant. But nitrogen is an example of that. Magne magnesium is a good example of that. Uh, and that's kind of how we visually sometimes assess uh, plant deficiencies. Uh, and so what you would need to do in this case, uh, probably since it's growing in a store-bought mix, it looks to me like a store-bought mix, uh, 
you can just add a supplement that has iron to the mix. Uh, and you'll find a lot of different things out there that have iron. If you wanted to go and buy some chelated iron in a little bag, uh, you could do that and put that kind of mix that into the mix and the chelation process or the chelation um, of nutrient what happens is think of it as a bodyguard around the nutrient in fact I believe the chelate comes from a Latin word meaning claw so imagine you know you have a tennis ball and then you wrap your hand around the tennis ball like a claw well that's the bodyguard protecting it and so instead of iron tying up rapidly which it does it tends to do especially in high pH soil you you end up with um, the chelate protecting it and the plant having better access to get to that iron. So anyway, fun fact. Another analogy that I like to use uh, in our master gardening classes, I use this analogy, and that is that uh, I think of it as you're making a long brick wall and you have two options. You can dry stack the bricks where they're not cemented in or you can cement them in. Well, if you had this long wall and you ran out of bricks, you could go back to the beginning and take bricks out of there to keep building the wall. That would be a mobile element. If you concrete them in, you can't go back and get bricks from the old part of the wall. You're just out of bricks. And so I don't know if that analogy works for you. I think it makes sense. Uh, so anyway, uh, hopefully for a few of you at least that, that is a helpful, a helpful analogy. Our phone number is 845 five six eight nine give us a call at eight four five fifty six eighty nine we'll be happy to discuss uh, gardening questions or you can email me at garden success at t a m u dot e d u garden success at t a m u dot e d u i've had a couple of questions come in uh, from some of you that i'm gonna have to reply to normally i do the emails on the air uh, just because with my job i i can't um, I don't have time to type them out, so just if you email me, listen to the show, and that's where you'll hear, hear the, the answer. And also, if you miss the show, you can go to our podcast, because Garden Success is available by podcast from your podcast supplier. It's also available online. If you go to the KAMUFM website and find Garden Success, there is a series of past shows where you can go back and listen and uh, hear your answer uh, at that time as well, but a couple of these I'm gonna I'm gonna either have to bump to next week or um, try to just answer them one on one uh, privately. Some unusual plants and will they not, will they grow here or not? Let's see. I'm gonna go back uh, to the emails here. Uh, had an email from um, Cheryl, and Cheryl it lives up in Crockett and listens to the show. Uh, and she planted some pecan trees uh, about uh, four, five years ago. Uh, and last year, uh, one of them started sprouting from the base. And they were, she was told, well, to get some pruning sealant and trim it off and uh, spray the cuts with the pruning. And it died not long after that. Okay, so I, I guess it's removing the sprouts. Okay, so here, here's why, it, number one, the tree was dying which is why it started re-sprouting from the base. Maybe the grafted part above the tree, for whatever reason, I mean, we could only speculate from drought to severe freeze to extended, uh, you know, a cold snap or, um, yeah, there's probably some other things. And so the, what you did was you cut the sprouts off that were still alive. They were probably coming from below the graft. And when you look at the base of a fruit tree or pecan, you will, you kind of can see where it was grafted or where it was budded. And uh, there's just a change in the direction of the, of the trunk right there a little bit uh, and maybe a change in the look of the bark. But uh, that tree was re-sprouting from the base and you removed that and so what was already happening to the tree finished happening to the tree. Uh, so that is, is something to keep in mind. If someone has a plant and they want uh, to r try grafting it themselves, you could leave one of those sprouts to grow and then try grafting it. Now that's, that's a task. It takes some learning and some experience to be successful with it. But uh, that would be the other option. So now um, uh, Cheryl uh, from Crockett was just talking about, you know, getting some other trees uh, is uh, starting to sprout again at the bottom. I just don't know why it is. And you have a County AgriLife Extension agent 
or office in your county with an agent. And you might give them a call. I can't remember the county name for Crockett, but anyway, you can, you can just go online and find them. Uh, they might be able to give you more insight because they might be able to have you bring a sample in or something. Uh, but I would just talk to them and see what they say. When I look at the bark on the tree that is kind of close up, I do see what looks to me like old coal damage. And uh, so that may that may be that it hadn't fully killed it by the cold, but then um, it started maybe a canker moved in or some other thing, and it started a process of that of that tree dying. So sorry to be the bearer of bad news, uh, but that is I don't think there's a chance of it surviving. But leaving cutting off the sprouts at the bottom, don't do that. I mean, you can, but it that's the the reason you think that killed your tree is because the tree was already dying. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689. Uh, and boy, we got some really unusual uh, emails. Uh, there's some of these. I'm just going to have to go look them up. Mary sent a picture of some bulbs. Uh, and then there's a couple of other plant questions. Most of the plants are from up north, and, and I need to get a better idea as to what their chances are here because uh, we just generally don't plant them uh, in this area. Uh, let's see. We let me go back to the to the emails first. Uh, so Dave planted a live oak tree, and it's about eight feet away from the water supply line, which is a one-inch PVC buried line. Uh, and since then, people have said that he may have made a mistake. And so, how far from a water line do you feel is a sensible distance? Uh, well. Tree roots are all through your yard. So no matter where you put a line, tree roots are going to grow over or by that line. Uh, so that is not something to be concerned about. The only thing that I would be concerned about is this, if they ever had to get to the line or replace the line or something, you're not going to get to it because all the tree roots will have grown over it, especially at that distance uh, from the plant. I don't think you need to move it. And um, if if a line was buried eight feet away from the plant, a lot of roots were lost. Uh, I'm sorry, that was just planted, my, my bad. Uh, so that tree hasn't begun to root out to that area. So you could move the line, but I, I don't think there's really a need to. I mean, if, if something went wrong, you would just have to put another line in, and you would put it in a little further away uh, from the tree when you did. So uh, keep in mind that tree roots are in the top foot of soil primarily, about 90% for most species in most soils. If you get a sandy soil, sometimes you're going to get more more depth to some of the root system. But in general, you know, a top foot of soil is a good estimate. So when you're going to put a line in, and this isn't Dave's question, but it, I'm just going to talk about it because I do get this question a lot. If you have existing trees and now you want to go put a line in, a trench, it could be a water line, a gas line, whatever you're trenching for, uh, when you go across that tree's root system, everything on the, on the side that's not the tree side, on the other side, all those roots are lost. So imagine looking down at a pie. That's the root system of your tree, the tree trunks in the middle. And if you were to take a knife and cut maybe just the last inch or two on the edge of the pie, you would be removing very little of the root system. But if you came right near the middle, you would be cutting half of the root system of that plant. And that is stressful. And if we go through anything like we went through this summer and you've done something like that, it's it's going to be a mess. Uh, plus, it, it, cutting that close or trenching that close would even affect the stability of the tree as well. Uh, so if you have to root lines, if you can route them uh, somewhere a little further away, if you can get even out to the branch spread of the tree, that would be huge in terms of uh, minimizing uh, stresses and damages. I'm gonna, our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And let's talk about some things going on around town. On next Tuesday, November 14th, the Texas A&M University Women's Club Garden Interest Group, they call that the GIG, Garden Interest Group, is meeting at the Presidential Library uh, at 9.30 a.m. 
Uh, so you just go out to the Bush Library, and the topic is going to be Inspired Holiday Designs, and this is one you don't want to miss. Uh, Dr. Bill McKinley, who is over the Benz Endowed Chair of Floral Design at, at Texas A&M, there in the, uh, used to be in the, it still is in the Horticulture Department. Uh, he is going to come out and talk about designs that is inspired by music and the upcoming seasons for your table and home decor. So he'll be presenting an explanation of how to do that, and I, I, I bet probably a demo uh, some of how to do that. And if you want to make your own designs, you can gain a lot just by watching and learning and hearing the principles and whatnot. So do you want more information on that? Again, next Tuesday, November 14th, 9.30 a.m. at the Bush Library. Uh, you email tamugig, T-A-M-U-G-I-G, at gmail.com. And you can find out uh, from that anything that you are looking for uh, on that. We'll see some other events going on here, but a lot of them pass by. Uh, November 18th at the John Ferry Garden Nursery, which is down in Hempstead, Texas. Now, I could read out the whole address, but it's, it's hard to get that down and listen to the radio. Just go to John Ferry, F-A-I-R-E-Y, Garden Nursery. Hempstead, Texas, and get a map, and you can see exactly where it is. The phone number, uh-oh, I only have six digits of the phone number, so I can't give you the phone number. The event is, uh, they, you can go to John Ferry Garden, and you can do garden tours. Uh, docents guide you. You don't wander through yourself. Uh, docent guided tours only. On, on Saturday, November 18th, they're going to have tours that that depart for the tour at 10, 11, and 1. You need to arrive a little before that so you can sign in. Now, for non-members of the John Ferry Garden Nursery, uh, it is $15 to do the tour. It's very interesting. This this has been, uh, it was started uh, as a, a plant collection. Uh, you know, people would take ventures out to, let's say, Mexico and bring back some plants uh, that they collected in Mexico to grow them here, see if how they do here. And uh, just over the years, uh, it eventually became a really nice, a really nice garden. So that's something you might be interested in. Uh, if you are, uh, let's see, if you are interested in a farmer's market, let me give you a few farmer's markets today. So there's the South Brazos County Farmer's Market, and they meet, or they meet, they are open twice a week. And they're at the corner of University and Glen Haven. So if you're heading out University to the bypass, it's the last street to the right. That's Glen Haven. And it's just right there. It's about a block or two in from, from a University. Uh, they meet every Friday from noon to 5. That will be tomorrow. And they meet every Tuesday from noon to 5. And it's a farmer's market. Lots of produce, uh, free-range eggs, gerb. Uh, jams, jellies, herbs, olive oil, and other things uh, like that. So it's a farmer's market. You get the idea. There's also something called Farm Fridays out on Tabor Road. Ron Bolton has that one. And they have fresh locally grown produce as well as other things, handmade things like you would see at a farmer's market. That's Fridays at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., 10 to 2 on Fridays. And uh, you can get more information on that one by emailing LLC at gmail.com. Uh, now, the College Station Farmer's Market is a brand new one, and it meets at the Post Oak Mall parking lot. I don't have to tell you where that is. A new members-driven market featuring locally sourced products, including baked goods, seasonal vegetables, organic meats, free-range eggs, plants, uh, homemade jams, jellies, can all kinds of good stuff. Uh, if you want more information, it's the phone number is 979-530-3768. Just at David Wolf, call David Wolf at 530-3768. And finally, last but certainly not least, the Brazos Valley Farmers Market, which is downtown Bryant at Main and 21st Street. Uh, they have a wide variety, just like I've been reading all, on all these others. And occasionally they have live music uh, there, uh, which is kind of enjoyable, uh, and crafts and things available. And for more information on that, go to BrazosValleyFarmersMarket.com. BrazosValleyFarmersMarket.com. So there you go. That's what's going on out and about from a horticultural standpoint things you might be interested in. Well, our phone number is 845-5689 or by email at email, six, <laughs> at email gardensuccess at t-a-m-u 
dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu uh, let's see jesse and becky had emailed about uh, downsizing from a really large house a large garage and everything uh, into uh, where they move their plants into the garage for the winter time uh, a little protection there now they have a smaller garage it doesn't have windows on it and what do we do they're thinking about building a greenhouse a, or assemble it yourself type greenhouse and putting on the south wall uh, on top of the lawn and you can do that they're looking at one that's four by six by six that's pretty small uh, but uh, you can you can do that right up against the house being on the south side the summer sun travels low in the sky and uh, so it's going to get a lot of sun so you're going to need a way to be able to uh, reduce the heat believe it or not uh, this winter it, it can be a cold day but just like if you go out to your car let's say it's 50 degrees outside and your car has been sitting in the full sun it's not 50 degrees in that car. I mean, it may actually be toasty in that car uh, from the sun shining through. Well, just remember with this greenhouse against the wall, especially like a brick wall that would tend to collect heat even additionally, uh, that you're going to need to have some sort of a, a way where you can open it up at the top and the excess heat could rise and go out, uh, maybe a little uh, vent opening. It may come with one, uh, too, if it is a kit. So... Uh, yeah, I, I think that is probably the, the best thing. And also just be ready on really cold nights to provide a little heat. And you can just use a little space heater. Just always when we're using space heaters and heat lamps and things outside, make sure that uh, they are protected from the elements and that the, the plug, maybe the extension cord where it plugs into the heat lamp, that that also is protected from rain and the elements and not sitting in dry grass and there's a lot of ways that can that kind of thing can go wrong uh, but you can do that uh, some of the little space heaters allow you to kind of it's like an internal thermostat where you can make it not not very hot to cranked all the way up and you can figure out how long you need to run that that works pretty good by the way uh, if you have uh, an interest in learning more about protecting your plants from cold, because here comes winter. Uh, Dr. Money Nesbitt and I put together a publication that's available now on AgriLife Learn. We did it a few years ago. AgriLifeLearn.tamu.edu. That is the bookstore. That is where you get all kinds of AgriLife products, most of which are free publications on all kinds of things, not just gardening. And uh, if you go there and you just have to hunt for its frost and freezes, uh, landscape plants, put some search words like that in and scroll down. Unfortunately, it doesn't pop to the top like it should when you put the exact title of the thing in, but or uh, main words from the title. Uh, but you can find it. It's nine pages, got full color. It'll explain the difference between frosts and freezes and the different kinds of freezes and the steps that you can take to protect plants. Everything from making sure the soil stays moist because moist soil holds heat better uh, to things like uh, spraying the plants with water. You've seen that uh, with ice on citrus trees, maybe with a citrus grower. The, the fast answer to that is don't do it. Uh, and it'll explain why in the publication. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's very, very helpful. And so you can download that for free. Again, nine color pages, really easy, easy, easy uh, to follow. I think a lot of times I see people when they're protecting plants from the cold, uh, they do things that I guess make sense to the gardener, but don't work. So for example, um, wrapping plants with a wrap that goes around and ties to the trunk. So you've got, let's say you have, we'll use citrus. Let's say you have a satsuma lemon tree in the backyard. It's got a little trunk and then the, the top, the head of the tree. And people wrap around it and tie that wrap to the trunk. Well, that's called a landscape lollipop and it doesn't do much, if any, good at all. And the reason is, because you think, well, if I wrap something, why isn't it staying warm? Well, our bodies produce heat. So when you wrap yourself in a quilt, you're able to stay warm even in cold weather because your body is heating the heating up in there and the wind can't get to you to super cool your your body and cool it off but plants aren't doing that and so with them we need to preserve whatever heat we have or add heat to it 
And so with, with those, we want something that drapes down over the plant to the ground and is secured by soil or bricks or rock or whatever you got. You're going to need something with weight if the wind's going to blow uh, to the ground so that no wind blows up underneath that cover. But the warmth of the soil rises up under the cover and the wind can't go through to cool things off. I mean, you know, it's, if you stand in a certain temperature, it's not nearly as cold as if the wind's blowing with that temperature. Uh, it just cools off faster. And with a lot of our freezes, it doesn't get freezing until toward the end of the night. And then by the time the sun comes up, it's already back above. So we just need a little bit of protection there. But anyway, if you if you need more, then you put a heat lamp underneath it. And again, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details. Look at that publication uh, on uh, protecting plants and landscapes uh, from frosts and freezes. That's not the exact title of it. But it even has diagrams on how to do the what I'm describing to you. Uh, and if you provide enough heat underneath and you prevent the wind from blowing through there and displacing that heat, you can go a long way toward protecting a plant. Uh, it's amazing some of the things that came through. And I'll give you an, I'll give you kind of an example of that. Uh, when we got down to seven degrees here, February 21, I had a vegetable garden and. I uh, broccoli and some other things in it, and that is too cold for the plants that I had in there. So, but I put a plastic over the plants, and then I secured it to the sides. I didn't even use heat underneath it. Uh, the soil was the heat underneath it. Now then we got this snowfall that sort of fell in the, you know, it was a up and down uh, with each row. You know, the plastic would go up and down to kind of fell into the low areas, but coming out of it. Some plants were hardly damaged at all. Those where the plastic touched the leaves, that was burned, uh, and that's that's natural. And the, if you want to know why that is, read the publication. We put that kind of thing in there as well. Uh, but I I was really impressed with just the benefit of holding soil heat in. Uh, we had some Mexican heather, which is not cold hardy. I mean, a, a freeze turns the whole top brown. Uh, and if it gets cold enough, I guess you can kill the crown of the plant, too. We had some Mexican heather. I did not. I tried covering it, uh, kind of used some quilts and things where we had it. And then it snowed on top of that, and it came through. All the top froze, but the base survived and came through and re-sprouted. We're enjoying Mexican heather still, despite the February 2021 20, freeze. But the reason was the snowfall with the blanket. Uh, it just created a protection that kept the temperature at there at the base of that plant from ever getting cold enough to kill the plant. That's probably more nerd stuff than, than you want to know about. But anyway, uh, it's frost and freeze season. Oh, one, one uh, tip for the wise. Uh, don't wait <laughs> until the freeze is coming that night to go and try to find plastic and heat lamps and everything, they won't be there. <laughs> I've, I've made that mistake myself before. Uh, and I, I found myself sometimes, I shouldn't tell you this on the air, I found myself sometimes out there, it's after dark and the wind's blowing and I'm about to die of frostbite trying to cover plants <laughs> and get through the night. <laughs> Don't try this at home. Uh, but seriously, uh, be ready to go. And, and ready to go means some good heavy-duty clamp light fixtures. Uh, the little aluminum shields that go over the light. Uh, these are the things, typically if you've got a security light on your garage, you've got these two big bulbs that, that kind of widen out. And, you know, they screw into a light bulb socket, but they, they're bigger than that. Uh, and even that kind of light, if it's 150 watts or so, that produces some heat. Now, you know, it, it only produces some heat, but again, we under the cover, we don't have to keep it 50 degrees. We just have to keep it 33 degrees or 32 degrees even, uh, and the plants are not going to be, be killed by it. Uh, if you'd have to take it up another step, then I would use a heat lamp, but be very careful because heat lamps radiate their heat out. And if you push, if you point them toward the trunk or the branches or anything of that plant, it will do damage, especially if you get it too close. And so just point them at the ground and let the heat rise up underneath there and they'll be just fine. All right. Well, that's a lot about cold protection. Uh, I hope we don't have to repeat it later because some blue norther is coming through that's historic cold. 
Uh, if you'd like to give us a call, we got time for another call, or maybe two. Our phone number is 845-5689, and by email, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. I talked about the I talked about the lawn and fall fertilizations and things. Uh, the winter weeds are are about germinating now. Uh, it just kind of depends on your location and which weed species it is. It's all about soil temperature, uh, but things like henbed and chickweed. Um, and uh, the uh, cleavers, or sometimes there's a carpet weed. It's a lot of cool season weeds. And those seeds are germinating uh, now that the temperature's cooling off. And if you were going to prevent them with a pre-emergent, you would have to get that done really soon. And you may have already missed a few of them, uh, but don't delay any more if you're going to choose to do that. Uh, now's the time to get that done. Uh, we're about to enter the season where a uh, large patch, formerly called brown patch, is... Uh, making those big brown circles in your yard. Just remember that when you mow really close to the ground, and I'm giving you all the things that make brown patch worse. You mow real low, you put lots of nitrogen out, and you keep it wet. You water it all the time, or it rains all the time, can't control the rain. But when those conditions come around and the temperature's lowering, lowering then that's when you're going to see the circles. So once the circles form, you can't make them green again. If if you you could spray and completely kill the disease, which is not possible, but let's just say you could, you'd still have brown circles, and it wouldn't be until the grass wakes up and actually starts to grow in the spring that the brown circles fill back in. So if you if you uh, are in a lawn that is plagued by that year after year after year, number one, uh, take a good hard look at your cultural practices, fertilizing, watering, etc., uh, because you're probably part of the problem. Uh, but uh, if if you want to prevent it, then you need to put a product down ahead of time that can prevent that. And there's a number of fungicides on the market with various brand names. Uh, that will work pretty well against a uh, large patch or, or formerly brown patch. and uh, But preventative, get it down uh, because we are, we're, gonna, we're about to enter some um, rainy weather here. Uh, in fact, I would, geez, I don't know, maybe rain today or something. But if you could get it down and at least give it some hours of time on the grass to, to move in and, and uh, kind of protect, uh, I think coming out of this, or you could wait till we come out of the cold and do it right, or the rain and do it right away. Uh, that is what would be needed. Yeah, because otherwise it's, it is a mess uh, when that thing happens to your lawns. Take all root rot is another one that will occur uh, in uh, cooler temperatures. We have it in our lawns all year, uh, and it's one of those weak diseases that when the lawn is stressed, it predisposes the grass to infection by take all. Uh, take all kind of think of it this way it gets the upper hand. It's able to take out the grass by killing the roots. And when nighttime temperatures are dropping in the mid 50s, uh, that's a time when uh, you would expect this disease to be pretty active. So a fall application, but especially a spring application of uh, a preventative fungicide, uh, if you're dealing, if you're dealing with that kind of lawn. And if your lawn went through the drought and it's really struggling in things, you're going to see more take all next summer just because it's what happens. When you misapply herbicides that are stressful to grass and you, you over apply them, you're going to stress the grass plant and you will see more take all root rot. At least that has been my experience uh, in dealing with the disease. Uh, fortunately, we don't have any insects to gripe about in the, in the fall and winter. We're kind of done with the chinch bugs and the grubs being something we're treating for. Uh, but anyway, you get the idea. Well, let me just say a few words about uh, the vegetable garden. If you are interested in adding things to your garden, the beginning of November is still a time, a good time, to get in broccoli and Brussels sprouts and cabbage. Uh, that includes both uh, standard types of cabbage and even Chinese cabbage. Uh, uh, there are various types of Asian vegetables that uh, uh, tatsoi and bok choy and others that can be planted at this time of the year. Uh, so uh, this is still time to do that. Uh, what, what did I leave out of the list? Uh, collards, I left out those. Kale, kohlrabi, uh, those are all cruciferous vegetables. Super, super healthy. Research at Texas A&M Horticulture Department 
uh, Vegetable Improvement Center. A lot of these uh, scientists that work with AM Hort uh, have found time and again the benefits of these uh, compounds, as well as all of the medical research that's gone on. Uh, onions have quercetin in them, for example, that are very beneficial. And there's a lot of compounds in all the cruciferous vegetables. The, I call them the blue leaf vegetables because it's kind of a bluish green look. It's very different than lettuce. Uh, and I just named them. Uh, let's see. Any kind of cool season green is going to be healthy and good for you, really, uh, one degree or another. So I would encourage you to, if you haven't planted before, why not do it? This is a great time to plant garlic still. You can get garlic in the ground if you'd like. Good time for lettuce and spinach. Spinach kind of likes it a little more on the cooler side. If you've still got some multiplying onions sitting around, get them in the ground. Uh, we're getting toward the end of the time you'd like to plant them, but go ahead and get them in the ground. Radishes can still be planted at this time of the year. Uh, some things are a little bit on the tender side, uh, you know, like beets, and I think we're getting a little late for, for success with those. But all these other things can go in. And remember, if you don't have a garden, that's no reason why you can't grow vegetables. You can grow vegetables in containers, whether it is a cattle watering trough, a big oval one. There are some wonderful types of uh, store-bought uh, containers that you can purchase. Uh, here in Texas, there's a company called Vego, Vego Garden. Uh, this is in Houston that produces a uh, bed that you put together. So you can make it any shape you want, any width you want. Uh, and that's kind of cool. Or just get you a five-gallon bucket, drill a bunch of holes in the bottom, and fill it full of a quality potting soil and grow in that. I grew three kale plants uh, one year in, a, in about a two-and-a-half-gallon bucket, and that's a little on the small side, or two-and-a-half-gallon nursery pot. Uh, but a five-gallon bucket will grow a lot. You can grow carrots in a five-gallon bucket. You can grow uh, all the cool-season greens that you want. Now, my favorite container for growing vegetables is a wheelbarrow. I have three wheelbarrows that, uh, actually two now, two wheelbarrows that have holes in the bottom. Uh, they, they hold soil, but they don't allow uh, the soil to, to wash out. They, they allow the excess water to wash out. And those wheelbarrows filled with soil, oh my gosh, you can grow any season of the year lots of good things. I had one that had broccoli and it had kale and spinach and lettuce and couple of other things in it and it was just beautiful you know roll it you can roll a wheelbarrow out to the sunniest spot in the yard and you can roll it into the garage when a freeze that's going to kill your your plants threatens so i like i'm partial to wheelbarrows uh, plus they give the neighbors something to talk about as if they needed something else to talk about <laughs> Well, you've been listening to Garden Success, and I'm your host, Skip Richter. We're going to be here every Thursday from 12 to 1. I hope you'll tell your friends about the show, uh, even folks as far away as Crockett. <laughs> we are glad to have you. And if you miss a show, remember you can listen online or you can go to our podcast. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.